good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the orientation lecture of the batch of 2021-23 of department of geopolitics and international relations we have um, an eminent scholar dr ishwaran sridharan with us so on behalf of department of geopolitics and international relations and manipal academy of higher education i heartily welcome you sir it's a pleasure to have you here uh, you are aware of our existence you are aware of the type of activity that we are doing but yet just for the information we started as a postgraduate program and a phd program uh, in 2010 and since then we have been uh having this program on uh, geopolitics and international relations in main geopolitics and international relations and uh, uh we have been trying to have an understanding of international relations from india's perspective the work has been towards uh how to mold young scholars to think from india's perspective because as we are aware that we have lot of theories and other things especially in international relations which are western driven yet how we can utilize and then have an indian perspective has been our endeavor and uh, it's our uh, great pleasure to have you uh, here for the sake of audience i would like to introduce dr shridharan um dr ishwaran shridharan is academic director and chief executive of the university of pennsylvania institute for the advanced studies of india in new delhi for its uh, inception in 1997 uh, and was earlier with the center for policy research new delhi is a political scientist with research interest in the party system and coalition politics political economy of development and international relations theory and foreign policy he is the author of the political economy of industrial promotion indian brazilian and korean electronics in comparative perspective 1969 to 1994 this published in 1996 and has co-edited with zoya hassan and r sudarshan india's living constitution ideas practices and controversies 2002 again uh, republished in 2005 co-edited with anthony de costa india in the global software industry innovation firm strategies and development uh, he also co-edited with peter de souza india's political parties in 2006 and edited india pakistan nuclear relationship series of deterrence and international relations in 2007 international relations theory and south asia volumes 1 and 2 in 2011 coalition politics and democratic consolidation in asia 2012 coalition politics india selected issues at the center and the states in 2014 he has published over 85 journal articles and chapters in edited volumes he has held visiting appointments at the university of california berkeley london school of economics institute of south asian studies of the national university of singapore and institute of developing economies economies tokyo He is the editor of India Review, a refereed routed journal, uh, and he is on the editorial advisory board of uh, Commonwealth and Comparative Politics. He earned his PhD in political science at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Shridharan has been a Kasi non-resident visiting scholar since 2001 and was in residence at Penn as a visiting scholar in spring 2009. Of late, we have been seeing a lot of our students who have been working on india and india's foreign policy have been utilizing his work uh, in fact one of our student worked on south asia and looking at india's power projection and what type of power india is the way it has been perceived by the neighborhood a uh, whole dissertation in masters was based on his work now presently he is joining uh, the institute of defense analysis in uh, in new delhi so he's been an extremely influential scholar with regard to and secondly this semester we have a uh, varied sort of subjects starting from uh, india's world view india's foreign policy indian politics and government perhaps one scholar who would fit into lot of these uh, subjects that we are having in this particular semester is dr shridharan so perhaps there would have not been a better person than him to deliver this orientation lecture as i mentioned it's indeed a pleasure to have you today sir now uh, over to you to deliver the lecture on assessing india's probable trajectory from rising power to great power thank you sir sir please unmute yourself okay uh, can you hear me now yes sir yes sir okay 
Thank you so much, Dr. Nandu Kishor, for that very kind introduction. And I would like to start by thanking the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations of the Manipal Academy of Higher Education for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I had the great pleasure of delivering the lecture at a conference at uh, your department in August 2012, many years back. Uh, so I am very happy to join you again, although this time over the internet. So uh, the topic of my, I expect will take about, uh, you know, 40, 50 minutes will uh, be about India's uh, possible trajectory from rising power to great power. I am trying to be careful here. I don't want to say that India will become a great power because in the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years, it's difficult to predict the future. It depends on both India's capabilities and policy actions and in how the world changes and the region and the extra regional uh, how the Asian situation changes. It is unpredictable. So I'm calling it the possible trajectory from rising power to great power. What I will do is in the next 40, 50 minutes, I will first uh, uh, look at how do you assess power of, of countries in this world of nation states of sovereign states. And then I will come to uh, how do you define who the powers are? What is a superpower? What is a great power? What is a regional power, a middle power? And what are who are the rising powers? Uh, let's get try to get some definitional clarity before we can talk about India's trajectory from rising power to great power. Having done that, what I will do is I will lay out Roughly speaking, in the last 10 years, 2010 to, to say 2010, 11 to the present, 2021, what have been the power shifts in the world, roughly speaking, to the extent that we can measure them? Some things are not easily measurable. And then I will look at uh, uh, then uh, what are the uh, constraints uh, on rising powers and especially on India. And what kind of power is India and what kind of power can India become? Can India become one of the great powers? Given that if you define great powers, it depends how you define great powers. Uh, and then what are the uh, strengths and weaknesses of India? What are the factors which favor India's rise? What are the factors which might impede India's rise? And so come to a rough, three rough scenarios, three, four rough scenarios of what might happen. And as I emphasize, it's not just that what India does, it's also how the world and the regional and extra-regional situation changes, which is beyond factors beyond our control. So let me first start with uh, what is power today? I mean, uh, how do you measure power of nation states? Now, very broadly, I mean, without going into international relations theory, IR theory, uh, I just want to say, that, I mean, there are several IR theories, but for our uh, uh, the broad approaches relevant to us are the neo-realist and the neoliberal, because they have a different approach to the assessment of power. Uh, neo-realist approaches tend to privilege hard power, that is military power, uh, in their assessment of power. This is, and they take a long historical view. Uh, now, neoliberal approaches, uh, the neoliberal approach really began, you can say, with Kyohen and Nye writing in the late 70s uh, about power and interdependence, about complex interdependence, about how military power is less and less defining and economic power is more and more important. Economic power in its related underpinnings, that is uh, scientific and technological and industrial power, uh, these are said to be more and more important in the assessment of power in the last uh, 40, 50 years. Uh, because the world is changing in ways, uh, the neoliberals argue that military power is becoming less important. Now, uh, the neoliberals argue essentially that hard power, military power, even in a nuclear age, in fact, precisely because uh, the five official nuclear powers and then the four other nuclear powers, meaning India, Pakistan, uh, Israel, and North Korea, and nine. Uh, De, de facto nuclear powers, uh, nuclear weapons are less and less usable in the sense, uh, and they are less leverageable. You can't use it, you can't threaten to use it. 
there's been no use of a nuclear weapon despite a massive stock has accumulated 90% of which are held by the US and Russia but also by the other seven by Britain France China and by uh, India Pakistan Israel and North Korea uh, the de facto uh, are declared or the some of them de facto some of them declared uh, nuclear powers uh, no nuclear weapon has been used after Nagasaki after August 9th 1945 so there's been an extraordinary uh, uh, a break in the whole flow of world history i mean world history from the beginning of mankind on every continent has been marked by uh, conquests acquisition of territory building of empires invasions and so on a war has been part of the flow of history now after the first world war which was uh, unprecedentedly destructive you had a 99 year period of relative peace among the great powers of the day from 1815 end of the napoleonic wars to 1914 outbreak of world war 1 and then you had the interwar period where you had seven major powers you had basically britain france the old colonial powers germany japan italy the rising powers of that day uh, and uh, you had the soviet union uh, the post revolutionary uh, soviet union and you had the united states which had arrived as the largest economy by the early 20th century uh, but had not yet uh, projected power in a significant way uh, uh, internationally so you had seven power competition in the interwar period which uh, the world order broke down you had the world war 2 unprecedented destruction and you had the two things happened in 1945 we redefined world order one was the uh, advent of nuclear weapons and then the rapid acquisition of nuclear weapons 1949 by the soviet union 1953 by britain 1960 by france 1964 by china followed later israel de facto by the late 1960s and then india tested in pokhran 1974 uh, and pakistan has now said that they had it by 1991 they tested it only in 1998 and they conducted its second round of tests so uh, but nuclear there has been no interbred war if since 1945 except the uh, soviet chinese clashes on the usuri river in manchuria siberia manchuria border in 1969 march 1969 you had no direct great power into great power or use of nuclear weapons so what has been happening also is an unprecedented uh, 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 globalization of the world economy uh, by liberalization of trade the trade gdp ratio has steadily risen in the post war period though it has flattened out after the 2008 uh, world financial crisis but it is unprecedentedly high uh, even for large economies uh, and uh, 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 there has been a massive intertwining of economies where the new liberals argue you can't threaten to use nuclear weapons because any destruction of the economies on the world will boomerang back on your own economy and you may also be physically destroyed there's a situation of nuclear deterrence between the two largest nuclear powers the US and the Soviet Union I and mean, Russia uh, now and you have also deterrent capabilities by the other parts so they are arguing that nuclear weapons become uh, basically unusable accumulating a huge stockpile is irrelevant and add to your power you have to have basically a deterrent credible deterrent capability there's no need to have massive overkill capabilities like was accumulated during the cold war up to 1990 1991 after that in the last 30 years there's been a build up in 1991 soviets and us had 12000 and 1000 strategic nuclear weapons i'm talking about not counting tactical nuclear weapons that has been built down under the uh, 2010 new start award uh, uh, to uh, 1550 each and which has just been renewed extended for a year from 2021 and which uh, is the uh, basic sort of uh, 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 guarantor of global nuclear stability so there has been a build down uh, and which reinforces the new liberal spot they say that increasingly since you cannot threaten to use nuclear weapons and you cannot leverage a massive nuclear stockpile the way the russians have a massive nuclear stockpile to get your way in world politics what is increasingly important is your economic capability and its underlying industrial competitiveness based on science and technology so there are two views of our today one is the traditional liberalist view that military hard power is what is ultimately determinative because the world is still anarchic uh, there is i mean uh, and the, the new liberal view the world is not anarchic in the old sense there is a world order which is 
is coming to say. And uh, uh, you can't, it's unlikely, an internet of war is unlikely, very extremely improbable. So there are these two views of the relative importance of uh, hard power, military power, relative importance of economic power in measuring uh, where countries stand. Uh, and so now that leads me directly into, uh, I've, I've given the two rough approaches and their justification. I mean, the new realists argue against this, that look, the whole of human history, this post-1945 is a small blip in the whole of human history, which is characterized by aggression and conquest. And world order can break down. Uh, it is true that post-1945 wars have happened basically in the developing countries, third world, not in the great power war, but this can break down. Then what they call our transition theories. Uh, you have China rising rapidly, uh, increasing its share uh, of world GDP and its relative power relative to the United States in economic terms also having a strategic nuclear deterrent vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. If there's a power transition, power transition historically, except the transition from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana at the end of World War II, which was a peaceful transition, uh, the power transitions tend to lead to wars. So uh, neuralists hang on to the hard power uh, uh, approach to measuring power. So now let me just come to uh, how you define uh, what is a superpower, great power, regional power, middle power, and rising power. And what are the definitions? I'm basically drawing upon the sort of hardcore uh, neorealist, sort of offensive realist position, Miyazima, John Miyazima, and Guzan and Weaver, who are kind of neoliberal, come, uh, they take a mixed approach between hard power and economic power. Uh, and they have theorized regional power in very way, ways that I have found useful. So superpower is generally agreed, is a power which has comprehensive military and economic capabilities exercised globally, not just limited to a region. And it is also acknowledged by others in the calculation. And that only one superpower today, the United States, China is trying to be one, but it has not yet got there, according to most assessments. It is still militarily confined to its region, by and large, although it is projecting able power now into the South China Sea, Western Pacific, Indian Ocean, and so on. But still, basically, it is uh, a land power which is uh, confined largely to its region, doesn't have the global reach, the network of global bases that the United States has around the world. So, the one superpower. Now, great power. What is a great power? This is a more complex question. Uh, a great power is uh, a power which is more than regional, more than just its region, but less than global. It is a sort of extra regional power. And uh, uh, according to the Buzan and Weaver approach, it can be uh, either a nuclear, it can, doesn't have to be a military power, it can also be a great economic power, great economic power like Japan and Germany, which doesn't don't have nuclear weapons, which are the world's third largest and fourth largest economies today, Japan and Germany, can also be considered great powers uh, by the sheer size of the economy and the integration with the world economy the system shaping capabilities. Uh, and the great power also, uh, according to Mia Saima, is dominates its region, uh, which is seen as a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition from a neo-realist perspective. So there is some ambiguity in the definition of great powers, whether you take a more neoliberal line by emphasizing economic power, or you take a more traditional neo-realist line emphasizing military power, regional dominance, extra regional uh, power projection capabilities. Uh, so I'm flagging this point because when we look at, when we ask the question, we go back to India and say, as a rising power, is, uh, which is by implication on its way to becoming great power, what kind of great power? I mean, how do you define great power? That also is an ambiguous situation. Uh, now, uh, a regional power. Now, regional power is confined to its home continent, subcontinent. It is only there, it's a, uh, it dominates it. Uh, and it is generally seen as more security related rather than economically related. Uh, uh, so uh, re regional now regional power uh, is also uh, both great power and regional power are constrained by both geographic factors as Mia Sainwa emphasizes, and also by what I call, I have called in some of my writings, two strategic factors. Geographic factors are like what Mia Sainwa famously calls the stopping power of water, he emphasizes land power. Projecting power across the seas is vastly more difficult 
uh, against middle power opponents, or even against middle powers, uh, uh, than projecting power across land. So the stopping power of water and the stopping power of mountains, like Himalayan range between India and China, is something where historically, even before the present day, present uh, period of history, uh, crossing high mountain ranges and projecting power was very difficult. So geographic features are constraints on power protection and on expansion of uh, regional powers to great powers. There are also what I call geostrategic constraints, by which I mean that it's not just what you have. I mean, if say a country has uh, various, if you measure all the usual power indicators, number of nuclear warheads, missiles, missile range, uh, size of armies, navies, air forces, their reach, all the usual military capabilities and other economic capabilities, GDP, share of uh, world GDP, share of world trade, uh, all that, your foreign exchange reserves at a given moment. Your, uh, all that it has to be compared with what your neighbors and your opponents have. And if your neighbors happen to be your opponents, your power is also reduced to that extent by what they have. Uh, if they are more powerful than you, singly or in combination, that diminishes your relative power. Power is both absolute, what you can count, and uh, a number of nuclear voids, etc., etc. And it's also relative to what your opponents and neighbors might have. So uh, regional power, now I have argued, is uh, something, regional powers, uh, you can be a regional power in three ways. Uh, one is, and these are not mutually exclusive, one is that you're a regional power by consent, where your neighbors in your region, in your continent or subcontinent, accept you as the leader of the region, as the spokesman for the region. Like Brazil is accepted, as a, what the term is called consensual hegemony, a hegemony by consensus that Brazil is accepted as a spokesman for South America. And South Africa is accepted by the, in Southern Africa, by other countries, by Namibia, by uh, Lesotho, Swaziland, uh, and so on, uh, uh, Mozambique as the spokesman for Southern Africa. Now, India, for example, I'll come to that later. Uh, so you can be a, a regional power by consent. That's one way of being a regional power. Second way is you can have compelling power, the power to compel your neighbors to do basically what you want, or at least to not do what you don't want, uh, like giving bases to others, having, you know, uh, uh, bigger uh, economic and other interactions with your opponents. So the power of compellence. The third way is simply size. You're simply larger by all indicators, economic, military, etc., geographically, uh, population, than your neighbors. You're bigger. So your regional power just by size, or you can be a regional power because you have compellent capability, and or you can be a regional power because you have the consent and acceptance by your neighbors. So there are three ways of being a regional power. Now, uh, what is a middle power? This is a nebulous uh, era about anything between 20, 25 middle powers in the world. Uh, and middle power is a nebulous term. It uh, lacks, middle power lacks system shaping capabilities, but a middle power is a power which, unlike many powers, which is the bulk of the world. I mean, remember that there were 51 sovereign states when the United Nations was formed in 1945. Now there are about 195 sovereign states, 194, 195 sovereign states, almost four times the number of sovereign states because of decolonization. Now, uh, 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 a middle power is a power which is uh, which doesn't have system shaping capabilities, but as the power to resist imposition. I mean, great powers cannot impose their will on middle powers and, and uh, determine outcomes in the way they could earlier. So there is a middle, uh, a bunch of middle powers which has risen up and increased the share of the world economy, world GDP, in the last 20 years or so. Uh, and especially after 2008, when the great powers found they couldn't manage the world economy with the whole G7, group of seven, which was, which Russia was added, and then it was uh, booted out in 2008 over uh, 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 the uh, uh, invasion of Georgia and then how over Crimea, Ukraine in 2014. So G7 couldn't manage the world economy. They have, after 2008, there's a G20, the 20 largest economies, including the European Union, as a separate uh, uh, player in that group. So this is a, a way of uh, recognizing that middle powers are important for the great powers to achieve outcomes. Great powers cannot just dictate outcomes. 
the middle powers have the capacity to resist imposition. And while they don't have system shaping or agenda setting capabilities, they have uh, they can be spoilers, they can be veto players. They, their cooperation is needed by the great powers in the last 12 years or so. So this is a rough definition of middle power. And what are lastly, what are rising powers? Now there's no agreed definition in the whole large literature on rising powers, rising powers literature, but roughly by implication, most of the authors uh, imply that rising power is a middle power that is on its way up to join the great past, to become a great power, which is also uh, uh, defin definitionally ambiguous uh, between neoliberals and neoliberals, as I just explained. Now, before coming to India and assessing India's prospects, I just want to say that uh, I want to assess the power shifts in the world, particularly since the global financial crisis of 2008. Now, uh, if you compare world GDP uh, in 2010 and world GDP in 2020, 2020 is of course the year of the pandemic, so there's been a shrinkage, but it, we are starting, I'm using 2020, not 2019, because 2020 is a baseline for looking at the future, where we are going to go, how many countries are going to come out of the COVID-19 imposed slump, and where they are going to go. So if you compare 2010 and 2020 world GDP shares, you find roughly uh, that uh, in, 20, uh, uh, in 2010, roughly speaking, uh, the US, I mean, out of a $66 trillion world GDP, US was about 14.6 trillion, or about 22% of world GDP. Now, the US has actually increased the share of world GDP to 25% in the slump year of 2020. Uh, in a world GDP of 84.7 trillion, the US is about 20.9 uh, trillion, almost $21 trillion. So it's about 25% of world GDP. But uh, Japan and the European Union have declined, even if you count European Union plus UK, uh, the way it used to be before Brexit. The European Union and Japan have declined in their shares of world GDP. China has risen dramatically from 8.7% to 17.4%, doubled its share of world GDP from 2010 to 2020. Uh, so China is the real uh, uh, star in the last 10 years in terms of growth and increase its weight in the world system. But the West as a whole, the Western alliances, uh, I mean, North America, US and Canada are uh, uh, were 24 and a half percent of world GDP in 2010. Now they are 26.7 percent of world GDP. So North America is strong, done well. Uh, the European Union uh, was 24 and a half percent in uh, 2010. The European Union has now shrunk, even if you take European Union plus UK after Brexit. I mean, you still count UK, even though there's been a Brexit, is shrunk by three and a half percent, 21 percent. China has doubled. And if you take roughly China plus Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China including Hong Kong plus Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, East Asian region, that has increased significantly. The East Asian region has gone from 19% of world GDP to 26% uh, uh, of world GDP. And that is almost entirely due to the rise of China. So East Asia as a region, it's not a political bloc, it's not a security bloc. Japan and South Korea allies of the US, China is an opponent. Uh, Taiwan is a de facto protectorate of the US, but half that regionally, geographically speaking, that region now is 26% of world GDP, which is larger than North America, larger than US Canada, larger than the European Union plus UK, which has shrunk to 21% of world GDP. So very roughly out of an $85 trillion world GDP in 2020, you have uh, roughly 26 uh, percent is East Asia, uh, 25 percent, uh, I mean, 26 percent is the US, and about 21 percent is the EU plus UK. So, and the rest of the world is the remaining quarter. So, about roughly speaking, about three quarters of the world economy is either North America, Europe, or East Asia. And the remaining quarter is the rest of the world, of which India has uh, about uh, India has uh, uh, GDP of 2.6 trillion, roughly speaking, in the slump year. It has slipped by one position and become the fifth largest economy in 2019 before COVID. And it fell behind Britain, but remains ahead of France in 2020 with uh, 
uh, GDP of about 2.62 trillion. Uh, so, and we are talking about, government has been talking about 25 trillion by 2025. I don't know if that's possible. It all depends on the post-COVID recovery of the Indian and world economies. So, that's where we roughly stand. And that's, these are the power shifts that are happening in economic terms. In military terms, all the major alliances remain stable. Uh, they, uh, under the uh, Trump administration, uh, uh, the, there was a threat to the Keystone nuclear agreement, the 2010 agreement between the US and Russia on a 15-50 warhead gap and uh, other sub gaps and all that, delivery systems. Uh, but that still has been extended and the Biden administration looks like wanting to renew it. Uh, what has happened, so this is the past history which have happened now against this backdrop and also looking forward into the future, India is now, uh, I would assess it as a middle power that's at the top of the heap of middle power. There are about 20, 25 middle powers. I mean, you have the big three in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, you have the Middle East, you have Turkey, you have Saudi Arabia. Uh, some of them have military significant conventional military capabilities, some of them some of them have major economic capabilities. You have in Southeast Asia, you have Indonesia, which is the 16th largest economy. That's only 16 economies, more than a trillion dollars GDP. Uh, you have China, you have Japan, and uh, in you have, of course, Germany, France. All. So uh, now India has talked in its annual report of the, of the Ministry of External Affairs about five years ago, pointing to become a leading power, act as a leading power in world politics. Leading power has not been defined. And in that same document, I mentioned like other major powers. They use the term major powers, of which they mentioned seven major powers, that is the prominent five in the Security Council, plus Germany and Japan. So implicitly, India is ranking itself as number eight. I mean, you can read it like that. Uh, so I would also put it, India at the top of the heap of the middle class. But to go from a middle class status, a great past status is a big leap, a quantum jump. And uh, India has uh, uh, increased its position from 11th largest GDP in 2010 to 6th to largest by 2019. And then in the post COVID year, it came down to 5th fifth, fifth largest. So, if we, uh, what are India's uh, strengths and weaknesses? Uh, Yeah. Now, strengths are that India is a nuclear power. Some scholars, uh, for example, Manjit Pardesi has argued India is already a great power because by military capability, it has it's a nuclear weapon power. And B, it is by 2019 was the fifth largest economy. So what more do you want? By economic and nuclear capability, you're already great. Power. But very few scholars follow that. Nuclear capability alone, just by itself, doesn't make you a great power. That, if that was the case, then North Korea or Pakistan would be considered great powers. They're not. So just nuclear capability doesn't make you a great power. Now, just economic capability also doesn't make you a great power, uh, necessarily. And uh, some countries, by the way, don't jump their chests. Some countries are very modest. Japan in its uh, external affairs ministry uh, uh, foreign policy annual report calls itself a middle power. Japan has been the world's third largest economy from 1969 uh, to 1980. And then 1980 became the second largest economy overtaking Soviet Union, till China overtook it in 2010. So for 40, 41 years, China, Japan was the world's third largest or second largest economy, yet not considered traditionally part of the great past. And they are calling themselves a middle part, modestly. So just economic power itself doesn't make you necessarily get counted as one of the great powers. One of the factors which the new realists uh, emphasize is that you have to be acknowledged by others, by the existing great powers to be a great power. That is, you have, they have, you have to be factored into their calculations. So it's a question of what, there's a huge literature now called the status literature in international relations, that countries seek status. Status is something not just by what you have, but others have to acknowledge it. It's like admission to a Selective club, okay. You want to join the club. The club members have to admit. So the status literature emphasizes that. So India is still, uh, uh, though it has nuclear weapons and it's the large economy, 
And uh, just these two things by themselves don't make you a great art. You have to have, according to the neorealists, go beyond your region. Uh, you have to either be a regional power, dominate your region, or you have, and you have to have extra regional power projection capabilities. You have to be able to project power into the extra regional uh, space. Now, that, uh, uh, so uh, this is something where uh, I'm just coming to in a moment. Uh, India has some problems. So, but India has nuclear weapons, 150 to 160 warheads, according to US estimates at the moment. Uh, it has a large economy, fifth in 2019, now sixth in 2020. It has a large navy and uh, has a presence in the northern upper Indian Ocean. Uh, 150 odd ships out of the 60 are major competents. An aircraft carrier, one more being built, one uh, 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 nuclear ballistic missile carrying submarine, a least nuclear sub from Russia, 14 conventional submarines. So it has a fairly large navy in the upper Indian Ocean. Uh, it has a fairly large, it has a large air force, 800 combat aircraft, of which most of them are tactical fighters uh, for ground for ground attack or interception, but mostly, uh, mostly large, largely not up to date. Uh, and it has uh, partnerships. Now, the, in, India is not an ally of the United States. There is no uh, binding pledge to protect India against China or against anybody else. But India is now part of this quad, which has been, which was formed in 2007 and went into uh, decline and then has been revived uh, since the great assertion of China uh, in the last one year. So the quad, which consists of the United States and its uh, Treaty allies in Asia, Japan and Australia, to which India has been added, not as a treaty ally, but as a part of it. It's a consulting mechanism. It's not a treaty alliance with a binding pledge at the moment, but it allows India a space to expand on its uh, increasing naval exercises to the west and the east, uh, to Southeast Asia, in the South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, with the Japanese, and increasingly to the west also, we have uh, uh, naval cooperation with some of the Gulf states. And uh, uh, so this is something where partnerships can help you get into the Great Power League potentially and also acceptance, the whole thing of acknowledgement or acceptance. Uh, so these are India's strengths. Now, what are India's uh, weaknesses? There are also weaknesses, unfortunately. Uh, one is that India is uh, by the two kinds of constraints I mentioned earlier, that is, Geographical constraints and geostrategic constraints. The geographical constraints are Himalayas. Uh, you can't project power northwards or westwards. Uh, you can't project power and the ocean, what Niels Heimer has called the stopping power of water. Projecting power across the oceans, especially large oceans like the Indian Ocean, is very difficult. Uh, so, uh, although you have a large navy, not an up to date navy, uh, you uh, find it difficult to project power. You are basically boxed into the subcontinent. Uh, by geogra geography and by geostrategic reasons. That is, your neighbors are also your opponents. Your China and Pakistan are your opponents with uh, unresolved territorial and border issues uh, with you over a long time. Now, in an ideal world, and I would support, it would be splendid if we could have a normal relationship and a resolved relationship, resolved conflict on territorial border issues and with China and Pakistan. But uh, in my writings, I'm keeping that as a given. I mean, I am, I've gone into that in the writings, but I don't think that's going to happen. So realistically speaking, I'm picking it as a given that this continuity from the past, the antagonism to China and Pakistan will continue. So India is, the entire North uh, is a pact. They're a pact power. We can't project power northwards because of two nuclear neighbors. Uh, we, and projecting past southwards into the Indian Ocean is also difficult because of vast naval distances. And no significant, I mean, there are no other significant major power there, except uh, the Western powers and Russia have a major naval and nuclear presence in the Indian Ocean. We are not the dominant power in the Indian Ocean, it's the US. Uh, so India finds itself boxed into South Asia. So the by new realist criteria, we are uh, not able to project power extra regionally despite the partnership with the Quad, which will allow us to do so in terms of expanded naval exercises, deployments, and so on. So that's a potential pathway towards mid past status through partnerships. The other thing is that uh, our regional past status is also contested. That is, we are not a regional power by consent. 
for acceptance. Uh, Pakistan certainly doesn't accept it, nor does China. But even the smaller neighbors, even Nepal, uh, resist our uh, uh, and Maldives, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, all have uh, strong uh, uh, negotiating partnerships with China, and uh, uh, they don't necessarily fall to the Indian line. So India is not, and we don't have the compelling capability to impose our will and just get them to do what we want. So India's regional power status is also a contested status. It is regional power only by one of those three major, one of the three ways in which being a regional power, simply you are larger, you are bigger, by all indicators. But you don't have consent and you don't have compelling capability. So India's regional, uh, these are, in, I'm just enumerating these some of the weaknesses, some of the uh, factors which don't favor India after having uh, outlined the factors which favor India. Uh, now, among the factors which favor India, by the way, are if all depends on post COVID 19 growth, if we can get up to a, a significant growth rate, 7 8% over the next 20 years, when we have a demographic dividend after 2020, after 2040, the population will start aging, there will be less younger people, less people in the working age group, more retired people, uh, older population, which doesn't make good, doesn't, uh, and there'll be a growth slowdown. So by that time, if we reach a sort of upper middle income status, right now we are also at a low per capita income, $2,100, whereas Chinese are at $10,000, other major middle class, I mean, Russia has a $12,000, Mexico $12,000, Malaysia $12,000, uh, Brazil $12,000, uh, and, you know, Turkey is about 10,000, Mexico. Uh, so the range of mid middle class are at 10 to $12,000 per capita per head. They're at 2,000. Uh, which is half of Sri Lanka. So uh, that's also a constraining factor. Uh, of course, when you measure power, it is the aggregate, the GDP which matters, not per capita GDP. You're not comparing standards of living, you know, how well off people are or not, how much poverty there is. You're not comparing that. You're comparing power. But uh, per capita income also has an impact in the long run on your ability to spend on the military. That is, in the last seven years, defense budgets have been stagnant. Uh, 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 and a lot of it goes into pay and pensions, not into acquisition of new tech, new weapon systems and technologies. The if you have a low per capita income and large part of the population is poor, illiterate, and so on, and doesn't have basic needs, uh, then uh, you can't jack up defense expenditure. There are huge social needs to be met, especially in a democracy, when people are free to vote for whoever, whoever uh, you know meets their needs. So low per capita income is also a constraining factor. Another constraining factor is that if you're boxed into South Asia because you have unresolved territorial border disputes, you have to have a huge army. Now, army is not the uh, 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 service of the future. It is uh, with uh, you know rapidly developing technologies and what is called a sixth RMA, sixth revolution of military affairs in the last 30 years, starting around 2015, where you have Increasingly shift to, I mean, to a whole range of new technologies which have originated in the civilian sector and are being applied to defense applications. Now, increasingly, uh, unlike in the Cold War, the leading sectors of technology are in the civilian industrial sector and business sector. Uh, the whole digital revolution uh, has led to artificial intelligence based autonomous weapon systems, unmanned weapon systems. It will be the uh, uh, weapons of the future, along with things like cyber weapons laser weapons, laser beams, all that. So all this uh, increasingly technologies are dual purpose, they are not. Uh, now here again, it's a double-edged sword. Our military is, we have to have a large, uh, basically labor-intensive, low-tech army because we have to resolve border disputes. That uh, constrains our military budget into acquiring and developing new weapon systems for the future, futuristic technological systems that the Chinese are doing very rapidly and trying to catch up with the US. So the unresolved border disputes not only box us into South Asia, limit our power production capability, but also limit our allocation of resources to modernize it, military modernization. In fact, that also. So, but at the same time, since we have a very uh, dynamic IT sector, a startup sector, uh, which is attracting major foreign investment in the last one year, despite COVID, we can possibly in the next 20 years develop uh, you know, apply new technologies to new weapon systems for power protection and for things like very time domain awareness, you know, awareness of what's happening some under the sea in the Indian Ocean to be able to detect, uh, you know, long distance military objects moving 
all kinds of new technologies are possible which we need to be very very innovative uh, 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 in the military applying new technologies to the military sphere to try to leap from so here again it's very difficult to predict what will happen uh, but it we do have some strong points technologically in these areas although our military is still by and large uh, not in the front rank of technology so then uh, the weak other weaknesses are well known that is we don't have oil and gas we are importer we are importer of all major raw materials except coal and iron ore uh, and bauxite uh, otherwise so we are heavily dependent on imports we have a very high population density we will become the largest population by 2028 or 2029 overtake china uh, there are about 1380 million 1390 million now there are about 1435 or 1440 million oh, uh, and we will become the largest uh, most largest population uh, populated country with very high population density pressure on water resources pressure on resources uh, and so on so we have uh, some strong points but a lot of uh, 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 disadvantages now how this plays out if we if a lot in my view today a lot depends on how partnership with the united states plays out because especially after the last one year since june 2020 the uh, 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 tension along the lsc with china uh, this is going to be a huge uh, constraint but it will also it has cemented the quad arrangement you know if through the quad we get a uh, uh, sort of avenue to extra regional tie ups and to technology sharing uh, acquisition of advanced weapon systems and access to technology to, from the us that could help us climb the gradient quite a steep gradient from middle class status upper middle class status to great class status in the next 20 years it could on the other hand the quad is a very nebulous arrangement it's not a nato like hard and fast treaty or like the us japan us south korea treaty or the australia new zealand united states and such treaty is not a treaty yeah, the quad can also fall apart in which case our hopes of riding on the us partnership to upgrade our status will go if and the quad can fall apart for the specifically for one reason if the chinese economy which is about now 65% of the us economy roughly speaking if the chinese economy continues to grow even a slowing china aging chinese population a slowing china will still grow faster than the us and the west if the chinese narrow the gdp gap some people say uh, that uh, china will overtake the us or catch up with the us by 2030 someday 2035 even if they narrow the gap from 65% of the us gdp to 80 85% it will make it more difficult for the us to constrain china at some point a uh, us administration which also has to deal with huge social demands in the us i mean if you look at the us budget now the renewal of infrastructure and so on domestic spending it will constrain defense spending it will constrain obama's 2010 level pivot to the pacific when they wanted 60% of us aero naval assets in the pacific only 40% towards the atlantic so uh, if that happens and the us at some time gives up on constraining china strike some kind of a deal which accommodates the rise of china militarily and in terms of power project on the second west island chain then the quad becomes less meaningful and then india's ability to leverage the partnership with the us to rise will also become that much more difficult and less relevant uh, so this is the rough scenarios it's not a question of just what we do it's a question of how us policy in the region changes and how chinese uh, the rise of china uh, whether it is successful in leveraging the latest technologies uh, to be able to uh, deter the us or constrain or push back the us to some extent so these are the imponderables the unpredictables which we i think have to deal with what i try to do is to uh, say that from where we are now roughly upper middle power to go to to great power status is something uh, which uh, we have strengths and we have weaknesses and we have an unpredictable uh, situation globally and in asia among the existing great powers so uh, uh, i would say that if we are able to growth is key i mean revival of growth post covid and next 20 years if we have 6 7 7 8% 6 7 8% growth and along with that uh, sort of 
uh, agility in developing and adapting new technologies, then we will get to great past sectors. We'll probably become the world's third largest economy, overtake Germany, which is at 4 trillion, Japan at 5 trillion, we are at 2.6. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, but again, to come back to theory, uh, does it make sense to be obsessed with great past status and great past themselves are declining? They are less able to determine outcomes. We have seen what's happened in Afghanistan, what happened in Iran. US, as a superpower, is not able to impose its will and determine outcomes. It has to uh, pull out. So you can do very well by being a middle power. My point is, in an emerging world where great powers are shrinking in their relative power, they don't determine outcomes to a whole mass of one powers. There are a large bunch of middle powers which are, power, which are powerful and able to resist imposition, able to uh, get their way in many ways. So you can still do very well, even if you don't get acknowledged by others, great past status. You can do very well where you are being an upper middle power in a world in which the great past will shrink. Uh, are not, the middle powers are coming up. So uh, that is also something to think about. I mean, we don't have to be obsessed with great past status. As the status literature points out, because middle past status is becoming closer, the gap between middle powers and great powers is shrinking. That gap is becoming blurred, you know. So uh, I have spoken for about 45 minutes, so I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you once again for inviting me to Manipal. Uh, um, excellent beginning for a very comprehensive uh, theoretically as well as looking at the practical examples of your even problematized how the idea of power or any sort of power that we are talking about. Uh, excellent propositions. I think now we'll invite uh, questions from the students. Um, you can raise your hand and then directly introduce yourself and ask Dr. Sridharan. Uh, I have um, a question that's been given by uh, one of our students by name Daksh Sharma. I'll just read out it to you, sir. He asked this question that how prevalent are traditional notions of power relevant to this great power status, especially when it comes to sphere of influence? You mentioned one of the important features of great power is uh, influence beyond the immediate region. But considering the advancement in technology, if a state from Asia can cause damage in a Western European state or a North American one without any military mobilization and just using cyber capabilities, then how do we assess great power status in the present day? That's the first question, sir. The second question is how big a factor will demographics play in South Asia and Asia in general? This is in context of China's population aging significantly by 2035. How do you think an aging China will change the dynamics in our neighborhood and what steps can India take to take advantage? Additionally, what is stopping Quad strategically containing China till 2035? China might not become irrelevant, uh, but their productivity might take a significant hit. Sir, you are. Sir, you want to take a set of questions or you want to go uh, one by one? Uh, these are the first two questions, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, OK. Let me just say yeah, uh, the first question is uh, I didn't follow uh, your voice cracked at one point. I didn't uh, get the full whole of the first question, uh, but uh, I, got, I picked up the, I heard what you said about cyber capabilities. That is part of what I'm saying. That is, uh, military power is being redefined by new technologies, by AI, by uh, AI-based uh, 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 weapon systems, including uh, you know cyber weapons, where you can disable possibly the uh, command and control systems of your uh, opponent uh, at a distance. I mean, uh, without using actually explosive powers. Uh, this is something which uh, India has. It's a double-edged sword. You are very vulnerable because you're highly dependent. Increasingly, will become dependent on uh, networked uh, uh, digital systems. But we are also have the power to, uh, you know, develop and innovate, which we need to do. And to, to, first for cyber security and cyber deterrence, then also you can have the capability of, uh, you know, intervention uh, or to preempt do cyber preemption. So this is something which is evolving. It's part of what is called the sixth RMA, sixth revolution in military affairs, which is going on, uh, say, four in the last five years or so. If you look at, I mean, the student who asked me this question, you could be the current 
the present uh, August 2021 issue of Journal of Strategic Studies, a good set of articles on how uh, new technologies are reshaping military capabilities and what all the major countries and some minor countries are also doing. Uh, not only the US, China, Russia, but also uh, Israel, South Korea, Australia, the Scandinavian countries, which are small but highly capable countries. Uh, how are they trying to leverage six RMA, six revolutionary military affairs? Uh, it, it, I mean, there's too much there for me to cover in a few minutes, but uh, India has to upgrade it technologically the way the Chinese are doing. Otherwise, uh, we will not be, I mean, if you have a largely outdated military, uh, it won't, you know, you can have a very large army in numbers, but it won't be able to achieve much. The second, the second question, yeah, can you just come back to me on that question? Yes, sir. Second one he asks is uh, how big a factor will demographics uh, play in South Asia uh, in general uh, and uh, sorry, South Asia and Asia in general, where he is trying to refer to China, uh, where population is aging significantly by 2035. So he asks, how do you think an aging China will change the dynamics in our neighborhood and what steps can India take to take advantage. Additionally, what is stopping Quad strategically containing China till 2035? This is what he's uh, talking yeah. about. Okay, let me let me take the two parts to your question. Now about aging, Chinese are aging rapidly. They have just in fact allowed people, couples to have three children now uh, to reverse that aging. Uh, now that's not going to be easy because people don't just respond to uh, policy directives from the top. But China will age, but it's already at about $10,000 per capita. It might uh, go to upper middle income or to you know lower rich country level, about $30,000 per capita, like about South Korea or wherever, some, something like that, $30,000, $40,000. By 2035, it's possible. Uh, they are going ahead very fast in leveraging the latest technologies for military and economic purposes. So they may be, so while they slow down, they will not grow at maybe six, seven percent, they may grow at five, six percent. They're already coming out of COVID this year faster than uh, was expected. So uh, aging will slow down their growth, uh, but they will still narrow the gap with the United States. It will become, uh, uh, they may catch up by 2035, like some people like our former chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramanian, wrote in a book some years ago. Uh, uh, that might happen, in which case you might have a sort of two great powers. Uh, now, the quad containing China, China is also in a sense like India. It is a regional power, not by consent. All its neighbors from South Korea, except North Korea, South Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, are and in India, to the Southwest, uh, are opposed to it or have some problems with it. So China is also not a regional power by consent. It has also a limited extra regional uh, projecting capability. It is going, sending ships now, uh, naval forces through the first island chain into the Western Pacific. It wants to leverage uh, latest technologies to deter a US attack uh, in case it takes over Taiwan, uh, which is a very advanced economy and a technologically advanced economy. Uh, whether the US will and the Chinese narrow the gap from about two thirds of the US GDP to about maybe catching up, whether the US will be motivated to intervene allow the Chinese to basically hand over uh, Western Pacific area to the Chinese and not try to contain them. What is a loose thing? Every Asian country now has China as a bigger trading partner than it has the US. I mean, China has become a bigger trading partner of all of the Asian countries, including US allies like Japan and Australia, than the US is. So they will be less and less uh, able to resist China. Uh, because the economies are intertwined with China's. So the Quad is something, it's a big question mark on the Quad in the next 15 years. It's not a military alliance. I mean, there's a US-Japan military treaty, there's a us Kansas treaty, Australia and New Zealand, United States. India is not guaranteed, and they have already made it clear that on the line of actual control with China, we are not going to save us. It's a naval cooperation in the Indian Ocean. We are supplying certain you know, petroleum services, and keeping a check on what's going on, but they can't help us in the Himalayas. So Quad is something which is as a question mark on how stable the Quad is, how quickly the Quad will respond. 
uh, and the big question now is really Taiwan because that is China's main interest and the uh, uh, various uh, straits which are highly monitored, choke points through which their ships have to go to get into the open Western Pacific. So this is something which is uh, open question. It's difficult to answer at this point. It can go either way. Um, Ms. Anupama? Uh, Ms. Anupama, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, it was particularly helpful for me because uh, for my PhD, I'm working on uh, how technology correlates to the notion of power status, and particularly whether advances or acquisitions in technology uh, can actually help a nation elevate its power status. So uh, I had a few uh, views that I'd like to share with you. Okay. Uh, so you started off by saying that the coming of the neoliberal uh, discourse and the complex of uh, and the concept of complex interdependence brought a lot of emphasis on economic power and techno industrial power. Yes, uh, but in my view, sir. I don't think that there was ever a parallel decline in military power as these two elements uh, acquired prominence. Even when you look at the sub indicators that are often found with an economic power, uh, namely GNP or purchasing power parity, the idea has always been that economic strength can possibly translate to military power and offensive potential, uh, to put it in Mearsheimer's terms. And this came true both in case of China and Germany which are also, uh, you know, huge territories and huge populations if you look at Germany around World War II. And uh, yes, I mean, I think currently, because there has stopped being a distinction between commercial and military, I mean, both military and commercial sources are looking at commercial innovations to uh, increase their war, fi war fighting effectiveness, especially given the changing nature of warfare. Um, so I think that Yes, military power will acquire prominence and will continue to be an important element, especially for the purposes of understanding the power status. Uh, I had one question for you also, if I could just proceed with that, sir. Uh, sir, about nuclear weapons and power. Yes, uh, there's a bunch of arguments that are very strongly made that they don't simply matter anymore and nuclear threats do not yield outcomes. Uh, and it's one of those odd cases in power asymmetry. Yes. But the purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter and dissuade. Uh, so in this sense, also nuclear weapons are mentioned as an important uh, weapon of prestige, uh, which Gilpin defines as reputation for military power. Uh, so in this sense, do nuclear weapons hold any relevance or will do, will they continue to be relevant for the purposes of understanding great power status or major power status in the future? Uh, thank you once again, sir. You've given me a lot to think about today. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, nuclear weapons will be uh, tokens of great power status. They will be indicators and measures of great power status. My point was, Nuclear weapons just by themselves alone, like North Korea or Pakistan. If you just have nuclear weapons, you don't have an economy uh, to match that, or you, then you will be considered uh, to you have nuisance value. North Korea has nuisance value, as the US says. I mean, you have to pay attention to them because they are threatening to be irresponsible with nuclear weapons, but otherwise, they have no real clout. Uh, so, uh, nuclear weapons just by themselves are not enough to be great, uh, go to great past status. Uh, you need a lot of other things there. Whole lot of things, uh, economy, industry, technology, science, etc. Uh, all those things. Now, uh, uh, you know, there are two contrasting cases: Russia and Japan. Japan has been, as I said, since 1969 uh, to today. It has been for over 50 years, either the second largest GDP or third largest GDP. Okay, yet it is not considered quite in the range of the great powers. It is considered great power in some ways. Neoliberals, economic, but. Uh, by a hardcore neorealist, it doesn't have, though it has a very powerful conventional and advanced military, but it's, it has what I call geostrategic constraints. Neighbors are Russia and China, which are major nuclear powers and conventional powers in the Far East. So your power is diminished by what your neighbors and opponents have. 
So Japan is a place where you can have it can be a major nuclear, major economic power, the second or third largest GDP in the world for 50 years and still be only on the fringes of great power status, uh, at least in neo-realist terms. Russia has a small economy, about 1.7, 1.8 billion at the moment, compared to 21 billion for the US. Okay, and yet it is this. Uh, 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 Russia and the US between them are 90% of nuclear weapons. The Russians uh, are matching the US in uh, strategic nuclear weapons because of the past dependent historical uh, uh, accumulation of nuclear weapons. Now, whether they can sustain that with a shrinking population, slowing economy, except with their vast area and resources. So, geographical factors favor them, economic factors don't favor them. They are struggling to keep up with the latest advances in the uh, in the technology-driven revolution in military affairs. But they have this huge strong part, so they have a deterrent capability. Now, uh, in uh, sort of a near cyber kind of approach, you see, a deterrent capability is only uh, one step. You have to have a power projection capability, a, a compelling capability. Okay. And there again, uh, the point I'm making is that great powers are using that compelling capability. Iraq and Afghanistan, like the only so sole superpower to admit failure, pull out of Iraq, or they pull out of Afghanistan, Kabul has been taken over by Taliban, effectively by Pakistan. So the great powers are no longer great in the old sense. They are diminished powers. And the, 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 the gap between middle powers and great powers is getting blurred. All right. So we are living in a world of flux, a complex world where the old distinction between a select club of great powers and the rest. That's not the world today. We have a bunch of middle class which are actually uh, uh, play major roles in the world economy and world politics, and we have to be taken on board uh, to if if the great class want to achieve the objective. That is the whole shift from G7 to G20 and from Quad. Why did Quad include India? Uh, not just traditional allies like Japan and Australia, because they found India can be a very useful addition to in, to constrain China, and that also helped India. We can try to ride on that, okay? Ride on that partnership. Whether that quad partnership will remain relevant, whether China will break out of it and be able to dissuade, as they did earlier, uh, that Australians and Japanese from playing along with the US because by using economic leverage, uh, that remains to be seen in the coming decade, okay? Uh, so uh, a lot of things are very unpredictable today because of the whole range of new. A civilian origin technologies being applied in the village. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Janardhan, please go ahead and ask question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such an enlightening uh, lecture. So, my, uh, as you have pointed out, as you have pointed out about the unpredictable nature of the world uh, politics and how it is shaping out. Uh, like even uh, mm -hmm. I was actually constrained with the question that you made while, while you were concluding that even great powers, there's a lot of shrinkage in their mm -hmm. uh, actual sense of being great powers. So uh, uh, because even the defense defense capabilities are turning more into artificial intelligence and drones and all that things. Now, my major question mm -hmm. is, sir, like what would be India's play? Right? Uh, like how should India do its international politics in this in this region? Because uh, already India is losing its uh, its uh, status as uh, slowly as a uh, regional power because of increasing China's assertiveness. And moreover, uh, my, my but the conclusion remark is that, sir, like uh, do we have to invest more into our uh, 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 social indicators in India so that that will have a trickle down effect? Because economy is actually playing a major role. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we have to grow our economy. I mean, economic power is a necessary condition. I mean, economic power alone might not get you to get past it. I gave the example of Japan. Uh, and, but uh, uh, economic power is a necessary condition if you want to get there. You have to grow your economy rapidly. Part of that, you have to also see that the benefits reach the poor people. You can't have a large mass of poverty. You can't have just the top uh, rich becoming richer and the poor becoming staying where they are, which is what happened in the pandemic. Uh, we have to come out of that and have a more equitable growth. Uh, uh, otherwise, we will face the what I call the per capita income constraints. If you have a mass of poverty and illiteracy, 22% uh, of the country is still illiterate. Uh, that would be the minimal definition of literacy. So that uh, will constrain your being able to spend on defense. Defense expenditure uh, is less than 2% uh, of GDP, whichever way you measure it uh, for the last seven years. 
despite all the challenges. Now, we have to have rapid growth and more equitable growth. Uh, and we have to be able to leverage and develop new technologies. You need an environment where there is an innovative environment. Uh, uh, all that is necessary uh, to be able to go beyond upper middle class status into potential great class status. Uh, now, uh, in the region, uh, I have taken the antagonism with China and Pakistan because unresolved territorial border issues as a given. I mean, I would like to see them resolved. I would like to see a South Asian region, but India seems to have given up on that. They moved from Sark, basically declared Sark as dead, to Bimstead, that is the eastern rim of South Asia plus Myanmar and Thailand. Now, that's also not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. We have not joined the regional comprehensive economic partnership, RCEP, which is the new free trading bloc, which includes ASEAN uh, and uh, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. So we are not part of that. We opted out of that. Uh, 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 because the basic crisis is that Indian industry is uncompetitive. Our tariff barriers, we are becoming a more closed economy. In, in, in terms of the economic path, it's not just enough to be a large economy, you have to be a large open economy which absorbs the exports of others, gives them an incentive to bandwagon towards you other than try to balance you. Now, if you are a large closed economy, your, your market is not open to imports from other countries. They have no incentive. Why should they do nice things for you? I mean, you're not taking the exports, you're not taking the labor. We want our policy is, for example, on migration. We want all countries to have open doors for India. India should be able to go and settle anywhere, become citizens, and retain the loyalties and the culture. But we won't allow anybody to come here. Bangladeshis must not come here. People from poorer countries must not come here. Exception is Nepal, 1915 Nepal Treaty. Uh, apart from that, we want all doors to be open from India, but our doors are not, are not open. Now, similarly, products, uh, the average trade weighted average tariff has gone up in the last seven years from 13%, uh, uh, 18%. So we are becoming more protectionist, although the government is denying that Atman River Bharat is, uh, is uh, going back to protectionism. Actually, there is some reason. There is, uh, the economy has become more closed. So large closed economy is not going to be uh, uh, even if you grow in a major way, be as influential as a large open economy, which incentivizes others to bandwagon towards you by absorbing their exports or their labor. So that is something, uh, the crisis is that our, barring five, six sectors, Indian industry is kind of uncompetitive. We can't compete with imports. Any other questions any of you have? Um, first year as well as the second year students. Any any of you? We have a few more minutes. Oh, OK, that means that to a large extent, there seems to be some sort of a consensus. Um, now I would request Dr. Dhanashri to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, so uh, officially on behalf of the department, I would like to extend uh, our heartfelt gratitude to uh, Professor Sridharan for accepting our invitation and uh, and uh, delivering this wonderful lecture. He covered such a vast gamut of issues and I think especially for the first year students who have just started their uh, stint at the department uh, will I'm sure would have gathered a lot of knowledge because I think he in short introduced so many uh, concepts, issues, theories um, as well as things to actually ponder over, a lot of questions to ponder over and uh, consider in the discussions that we are going to have uh, as we move forward in the semester itself. He gave a broad historical overview. He looked into the relevance of technology, nuclear weapons, economy. He looked into notions of power, the concept of power. And I think the way he ended the lecture by actually saying that we do need to really uh, obsess over acknowledgement by other countries. Uh, of our great power status and rather look at the way the gap between the middle power and the great power status is actually kind of getting more and more blurred and that's a very interesting uh, takeaway from your lecture. I'm sure uh, this will 
uh, uh, this will uh, uh, instill a lot of thoughts in some of our students minds to write and uh, also uh, you know write their research papers in the coming months so uh, sir thank you so much once again for uh, accepting our invitation and delivering this uh, very insightful lecture to our students i would also like to thank uh, the head of the department uh, dr nan kishore for organizing this lecture and my colleagues particularly dr anand b who is a coordinator for this lecture um and he is the academic coordinator as well so since uh, we as i mentioned we started uh, the the semester for the first year as well as the uh, second year students this is the orientation lecture for them so i think it is like a fitting lecture for everyone in both the batches um i would also like to thank other colleagues who have helped with the organization of this lecture i would like to thank the university for uh, helping us sail through the uh, through the previous uh, month after the end of the uh, previous semester and then start this new semester and then help us also with uh with uh, inviting uh stalwarts like you to deliver lectures at our department although virtually and hope to actually have you physically at the department in the future whenever that is possible i would also like to thank finally uh the, the students uh, both batches and also uh, there are i see that there are students from other departments within manipal academy of higher education also who have joined this lecture it was wonderful to have you and also asking these questions very pertinent questions uh to uh, uh to professor sridharan and uh, and thank you sir for actually answering my question very patiently uh so thank you once again and i hope uh, we hope to see you sometime in manipal uh, uh soon yeah thank you thank you so much thank you uh, both to the department of the university for once again inviting me uh and thank you thanks i uh, thank all the students for their attention and the questions thank you sir thank you we look forward to seeing you here